can get started. Uh, Ken, Ken, it's Ken Beacon Dam, right? Is that how you pronounce your last yes, name? Yes, Ken Beacon Dam. I'm the only one on planet Earth with that name. <laughs> Excellent. That's true. Uh, so, well, Ken, let, let's start with where can people find you? If they want to right now follow you on socials or find a website of yours, where can they find you? Um, yeah, so I can pull up here. Why don't I might as well pull up my, my presentation? Okay. Oh, perfect. Um, let me... Uh, Okay, everybody can see that. Yeah, awesome. Okay, so um, yeah, the easiest way to find me is uh, you know my Facebook, uh, Instagram, just my website, legalsecondsuites.com. Um, and so yeah, today you know we're gonna be talking about get more out of your home, uh, as to use garden suites, garage units. Uh, we're gonna be getting into additions, um, commercial to residential conversions. Uh, you name it, you name it. Um, yeah. we're gonna be I, I'm just going to say, uh, I'm going to, Ken, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and your background rather than reading your bio. You can do a better job of it, but I would say Ken's a friend. He's also a very well-respected investor. Um, not only does he have a large rental portfolio with himself and his family, manages a lot of units, but he also uh, does a lot, uh, manages a lot of uh, second unit, rent, large renovations, commercial to residential conversions for other investors. So he has a ton of experience. Um, he's very well respected. He's a friend. Um, and this topic is particularly uh, topical for today because there's literally an article announced today um, that uh, the headline on CTV News is Ontario announces sweeping housing changes that allow three units on one property. Um, a little summary is under the, under the legislation, up to three units will be allowed on a residential lot without any bylaw amendments or municipal permissions. An example provided by the government shows a basement apartment and get garden or laneway house could be built on a property and rented out to, to tenants. Duplexes and triplexes could also be built on single residential lots, regardless of municipal zoning bylaws. Typically, these things take some time. Um, and the legislation would also make it so municipalities can't set restrictions on unit sizes or require more than one parking space per unit. So we've been figuring this out within the existing rules. The provincial government's trying to make it even easier to get this done because we need more housing. So with that being said, Ken, I'll leave you the floor. All right. Um, so I have um, my contact info up here so that you guys can contact me, you know, Facebook, Instagram, obviously, uh, the website. Um, I'll have this up at the end of the presentation as well, but, you know, uh, please do feel free to book a consultation with me there. It's free. There's no, no charge. Um, I would love to talk to you about your project. Um, you know, and there's lots of different, you know, types of projects out there and every project has its little nuances. And, you know, a lot of times it's very property specific. So, but the best thing that we can do is really to just jump on a phone call to talk about it, okay? And again, uh, we can put the, uh, the booking link in, in the chat, okay? And I'll have it again at the end of the presentation. And yeah, we'll be sure to put your booking link on the recorded webinar page as well. So everyone can find it there and we'll email it out to everyone as well. Okay, awesome. Okay, so um, yeah, a little bit about who I am before we kind of jump into all this stuff. So. Um, so I'm a solo dad. I'm a single parent. I uh, have a six-year-old son. Um, and so I'm trying to balance, you know, being an investor, being, um, you know, an entrepreneur, um, and being a parent at the same time. Um, and, you know, that does take some, some balance, uh, you know, to find that, that balance in life. But, you know, all of us have our, ha are, are busy, right? We're all uh, busy people. We all have our families, our children, our partners. Um, and, you know, real estate is also mixed in there as well. Um, and so I'm no different than many of you guys. Um, you know, I am a designer. I did start out as a designer. Um, you know, I've moved more into consulting, uh, contracting. More recently, I'm starting to call myself a developer. I'm jumping into some land development projects. Um, but uh, more and more increasingly, I'm really becoming a housing advocate, really seeing the need. Um, for, for good, safe, legal housing. Um, and to encourage us as investors to do things the right way. Um, you know, to create, you know, we're housing providers. We gotta create well-designed, uh, safe places for people to live. 
Um, I'm an alpaca farmer. I have a hobby farm and a bunch of alpacas and some goats and horses and other things there. Um, so my company and, and uh, my sister companies, um, so we're, we're doing about 140, 150, what I call intensification projects a year. Um, so that could be anything from a little basement apartment um, to, you know, on, on the larger end, you know, a 30 unit building conversion, converting commercial to residential buildings. Um, and so from, you know, my last count, it's about 250 units a year that we're, we're helping, you know, investors bring to the market. Um, and so I do cover quite a few municipalities in Ontario. Um, so I do have a, you know, a fairly broad sense for the different types of zoning that, that is out there, some of the different challenges that are out there from municipality to municipality. Some, some are easier than others. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, with that said, uh, so a couple of my goals for today's discussion, I would want to talk about some of the, the latest regulation changes that we, we've uh, been hearing in the media. Uh, we want to take a look at, you know, how, how can we maximize the profit um, or just, you know, maximize the existing space that we have in our homes uh, and properties um, and how, as an investor, you have to be looking at your portfolio and adding in more units, okay? Number one, number one, you have to be adding density. Um, I'll be sharing some lessons learned, okay, uh, about some things that you have to be aware of. Um, and then kind of how we can kind of take next steps together. Um, we see this trend happening everywhere, more, uh, more density, okay? More housing units everywhere. Um, you know, people are getting used to the idea of living in a smaller space, okay? Um, and it's uh, basically out of, out of necessity, but we're pretty much seeing, you know, wherever we possibly can, we're seeing, we're seeing the need uh, in, in people converting converting buildings and houses and whatever. Okay, so we need more, we need more units. And obviously today's announcement by the government, you know, is really speaking to that. Basically they're, they're trying to do whatever they can uh, to make it easier to build and build in more locations, okay? So this presentation is not all about uh, secondary dwellings. It's really about density, you know, in all forms, okay? But basically, you know, this is the types of things that we're looking at as far as what's an, an SDU, like a basement apartment, okay? That's a very typical traditional type of unit. I'm sure many of us are familiar with that. Uh, we have the second floor uh, units. Um, you know, we have, uh, it could be a rear unit uh, or an addition uh, to the home. Uh, and then uh, more recently, we've seen the coach houses, uh, the laneway houses, garden suites, whatever you want to call them. Every municipality has different terms for these things, uh, but it's basically a detached, detached unit. So how do we get here? Um, so back in uh, 2011, um, they came out with Bill 140, the Strong Communities Through Affordable Housing Act. So that's kind of what started spurring this idea of more housing being needed, okay? Uh, the province kind of recognized that we need the private market to help with meeting the housing needs, uh, basically allowing for a broad range of housing types, um, and basically declared that affordable housing is a provincial matter. And then uh, more recently, uh, June um, 6, 2019, is when Bill 108 came about, uh, the More Homes, More Choice Act. And that's what uh, we've been primarily focused on right now is you know permitting two additional residential units in a single detached semi-detached or a row house um, and permitting the uh, a third unit in a detached structure okay so um, so that actually got got uh, uh, received royal assent on June 6 2019 um, but uh, you know it once something receives royal assent, you know, the municipalities still have to take time to amend their municipal, their official plans and their subsequent zoning bylaws. Um, and so we really weren't able to truly implement some of these bylaws until, um, you know, basically like 2020, you know, um, we were, we were doing some stuff before that, but, you know, I know for my business, it really started taking off, you know, uh, you know, yeah, at the tail end of 2019 into 2020. Um, 
Okay, so then we come to today's announcement. Okay, we all see, we all read the news today. We saw the different articles um, about uh, about what's uh, what they're planning. Okay, so uh, there's been talk about this already. Um, you know, the provincial task force um, came out with some recommendations, um, but it's it's good to see that you know they are taking it seriously, uh, and they're 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 going to make some changes. Now, what do those changes look like? You know, that's another that's another matter. So um, just like many of you, like I'm reading this stuff, you know, today for the first time as well, okay? Um, and, you know, like any government announcement, you know, um, there's lack of details, right? It's all like big picture thinking, which is great, but the devil's in the details. Um, so here's what we know so far, okay? So they want to reduce development uh, charges and parkland fees, um, you know, primarily on, these uh, these new units, okay, this, the secondary dwelling units, uh, the coach houses, um, they're even looking at reducing development charges on uh, rental housing, okay. Um, it's a bit vague from when I read these articles, like rental buildings, builders would see DC charges reduced with discounts for family size units. Um, you know, there's talking about uh, the affordable and nonprofit developments would be exempt from various charges. I know, um, you know, not all nonprofits like are exempt. Like they're still paying huge exorbitant uh, development charges, uh, which really makes a lot of these nonprofit developments not not feasible. Um, so that I think that's a great move um, that uh, they remove those charges. Uh, you know, they're talking about freezing and reducing or exempting fees on new home construction. Um, you know, so, well, let's see what they actually, you know, what fees do they actually cut? You know, I know when we're applying for building permits, like all sorts of different fees, guys, it's, it's crazy what they come out with and what they say, you got to pay for this and pay for that. And, um, you know, they they want to keep pushing this, uh, rent to own program. Um, I know, I know some rent to own providers. Um, I'm in some mastermind groups with, uh, some other rent to own providers, um, and they spent uh, like the, um, uh, I forget what the organization is called, but it's like the rental housing providers of Ontario or something. Um, my good friend, um, uh, Alfonso Salemi from Jag Properties is, um, is part of that. And they spent a lot of time putting forward, um, recommendations to the province for how the province should implement the rent to home program, um, rent to own program. And guess what the province did? They actually ignored every single recommendation from this organization. Um, so it's all well and good that they make these announcements, but when they're ignoring industry professionals with implementation, we all know how this is gonna go. It's, it's not gonna go well, that's my feeling. Um, okay, so another thing that they came out with as well, which I'm sure you read, was they, they just raised the non-resident speculation tax on homes purchased by foreign nationals, okay, from 20% to 25%. Uh, guys, we all know that foreign national buyers of homes is like nothing. It's like 1% like of the market. Um, so I don't think that's going to make a material difference. Um, and then this is what I like here. They're going to loosen rules for projects with fewer than 10 units. So a lot of the work that we do um, in these small, like infill development and, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're adding, you know, four or five units to a building, you know, we're doing a lot of stuff that's under 10 units. Um, so it'd be really interesting to see what uh, rules they change uh, when it comes to, comes to that. Um, but look, guys, there's still a lot of details that have to be sorted out. Um, and for me, I'm not necessarily holding my breath here. Um, I want to see the actual change in the bylaw, the municipal bylaw, and what red tape they, they cut. Um, and I think that's still going to be some time before we actually see that implemented. Um, so that's kind of, so one of the things, you know, that drives me nuts. Okay, so they, they, they make a big announcement saying, oh, they're gonna allow three units on one lot. Well, guys, they already allow three units on the lot. They already allow two units in the principal, one detached. That's not necessarily a new announcement. That's already allowed. Um, some municipalities, in fact, allow all three units in the single family home, in the existing house. Um, Brantford, for instance, 
Brantford, Ontario, they already allow three units in an existing house. Okay. So that's, I don't see that changing in the city of Brantford. Um, other, other municipalities, like many, many municipalities still only allow two in the house with that third one detached. So this is where they could change the uh, requirements where we can put all three within the existing house. Um, so that will be a game changer because, you know, look, some of these, some of these big houses, some of these, especially these big century homes, these big old Victorian century homes, they can fit like three units very easy, easily and meet building code. Um, they could even fit four units, in fact. Um, so that's going to really help on those big uh, century home conversions, those two and a half story century home conversions that we see happening. Okay, so where are the opportunities to add more units? Okay, so I'm kind of going to go through uh, some of those different ones so that just so you guys can get a visual on, you know, what it is that you're, you're looking at. Okay, so obviously we have coach houses, laneway, and garage units. Okay, so no, we're really seeing, um, so a laneway house, um, obviously it's, it's basically a detached house that's abutting a laneway. Um, and then we have a garage, garage units. So this could be a, um, like you have a, a second uh, unit on the second floor of a garage, okay, an, an existing garage. Um, we have basically, you know, a new detached structure in a backyard, okay? So this is not on a laneway. Uh, where you know people are calling these coach houses uh, or garden suites, um, those are the two terms. You know, additional dwelling unit, secondary dwelling unit, detached. There's lots of different terms for these things. Um, converting existing garages. So we've done that quite a bit this year. Um, you know, taking people's existing garages and converting them into living spaces. Um, so that's definitely you know if the garage is solid you know, that's number one, it's gotta be a good solid garage. Um, the classic basement apartment, okay, I don't wanna spend any time on this one, we all know a classic basement apartment. Um, so if you have an unfinished, unfinished basement, like that's your number one place to start, first of all, is to finish your basement. Okay, so, um, so more and more, we're getting into additions, okay? Um, Cause look, how is like, just to buy a house is difficult uh, enough. So if you have the, um, the space, you know, you can build up, you know, um, the zoning permits the height, you can, you can build up, you can also build out. But so this is a project that I'm involved in. Uh, it's one of my personal ones. Um, so I'm taking this single family bungalow. Um, and I'm putting a second floor addition. Actually, in fact, we're tearing this whole thing down to the foundation, um, putting two more courses of block on the existing foundation and then building a new triplex on top of it. Um, and so, so basically, you know, I, I did have to get a minor variance for this, um, for this particular application, but, um, you know, I don't want to go down a, a rant on committee of adjustment, but, uh, but like this, this is an opportunity, right? Taking these kind of old bungalows and actually adding stories to them. Okay. Uh, I'm involved in another project, actually, just another personal one. Um, where we're taking an existing century home, okay, a two, a two uh, and a half story century home, um, and we're adding a big rear addition to the house. So we actually converted the house uh, itself. Uh, we did a basement apartment and a main floor apartment. And then we're adding basically um, an addition off the back um, to the house and basically adding another, you know, uh, basement unit, main floor and a second floor unit. So another three units in the addition. Um, so we're gonna have five units total out of this building. So, you know, if, if your property allows, you have the space and the setbacks allow it, you know, definitely adding, adding an addition. Okay. Again, zoning has to permit the density. Okay. Um, in this particular, this was closer to the downtown zone. So the density allowed for up to uh, like five units. Um, so the century homes. Okay. Um, so this is, this is what's nice about the new provincial announcement um, is that we could you know, potentially do three legal units in um, these, these uh, buildings. Some of them we can even do more, again, if the zoning permits. Uh, sometimes you find these houses and the zoning only permits two units, right? Um, but sometimes these, these old century homes are found in different zones that can actually permit a lot more. The, the picture on your right there, the semi-detached house, um, we're actually converting that into um, 
eight units total. Okay, so we have, there's two sides to the semi. You have a basement unit, a main floor, a second floor, and a third floor attic unit. Uh, so we're getting eight units out of this, uh, this semi-detached. Um, and so century homes are a great stepping stone from doing like a small single family bungalow conversion. You kind of, you jump into doing century home conversions before you jump into the larger building conversions. Um, so we're doing a lot of these commercial mixed use buildings. So, um, you know, as you, as you scale up in your experience of doing conversion work, um, you know, you start uh, tackling some of these larger buildings. Um, and what's nice about these types of buildings is oftentimes you can find them 100% uh, vacant. Uh, you can find them partially vacant. Um, you know, sometimes the zoning allows to convert the uh, boarded up commercial unit on the ground floor to convert that to a residential unit. Um, again, it is, you know, like anything we do when it comes to uh, conversion work, it's so zoning specific, like property by property, zoning by zoning specific. Um, but, uh, but this is, this is doing wonders for rejuvenating some of our, uh, downtown core areas that have these old buildings. Um, and, uh, you know, what's nice about being able to do a commercial building is the fact that, yeah, sometimes there's no tenants. It's a vacant building and you're creating units that have never, ever existed before. So you don't have to worry about like rental evictions and, uh, you know, trying to, trying to kick people out, uh, cause the buildings are already, already vacant. Um, and what's nice about some of these commercial building conversions is that, you know, we can take advantage of anything five or more units, we can take advantage of the uh, CMHC uh, MLI select programs, um, which is, uh, you know, government financing, uh, helping with, with these projects. Um, so here's some more pictures of some of uh, the building conversions that we've been involved in, uh, converting these buildings into, you know, the smallest one here is five units, but the biggest one uh, is 22 units here. Um, so this is, this is the building that I'm involved in, uh, me and my partners. Um, so this is, a, this is currently a vacant medical building, okay? Um, it's vacant. Um, and where the zoning permits, you know, 100% as of right, multiple dwelling here. Um, so we can convert as of right to, uh, we're going to fit 22 units in here, uh, about half bachelors, half one beds. Um, actually, we've already made our permit submission to the city for it, uh, but we're going to be doing some facade improvements, uh, making some of the skinny windows bigger, uh, you know, painting the building, adding some nice lighting, um, some nice uh, address uh, signs and, and whatnot. Um, but definitely, like, so what I'm trying to show you guys is that, um, you know, these opportunities are really everywhere if you truly start looking. Um, you know, another common one that uh, we're seeing um, and that, you know, is the keep and sever strategy. So these projects here are courtesy of um, uh, Andy Tran and Charles Waugh, okay, from Western Infill Developments. They do a lot of split and sever types of projects. Um, you know, myself, I do help a lot of clients with severances. Um, I, I you know probably, I don't know, maybe five, six, seven severances a year. Uh, you know, um, and getting to those types of projects. So yeah, looking for those double wide lots, those corner lots, um, you know, and, and trying to see if you can sever a lot because that's huge value add if you can actually sever some land. Land, land is valuable, right? Okay, so, um, so that's basically a quick highlight of the types of projects, okay? Your basement apartments, your coach houses, uh, your additions, Okay, um, your large century homes and your kind of rundown commercial mixed use buildings. Okay, um, and you know, every single city has them. We see them everywhere. Um, so you have to open up your mind and imagine the possibility uh, because with all of these changes happening with zoning bylaws, you know, it's getting more and more permissive um, to add the density. Okay, so when you're out there shopping and purchasing uh, a property, you know, the bigger, the better, okay? Square footage is sexy. Um, the, more, the more land you have, the better, okay? Because the more potential that there is to do something with that, with that property. Okay, so, so we think we found something, right? That, oh, shoot, okay, we can probably add, you know, X amount of units to this, this building. What do we actually do, okay? Um, so 
this is some of the uh, things that we need to look for, okay? Um, so I'm going to use the, the city of Hamilton just as an example. Obviously, that's the city that we're based out of. We have our office in downtown Hamilton. Um, but I'm just going to use it as an example, okay? So with any, with any project, okay, any type of intensification project, you have to know the zoning bylaw. You have to know the zoning designation for that property and what that property will permit, okay? Not necessarily what that building can accommodate, but what that property would permit as far as the density, okay? So you have to, if you're gonna be in this game, you gotta under, you have to learn how to navigate city zoning maps, okay? Um, and every single city has them on their city website. Some cities are better than others, okay? Some, they have a nice interactive map where you just type in the address and it pulls up the zoning designation. Other cities are really old school and you have to dig through the, um, the, uh, the schedules and the zoning maps. But basically, you got to find out the zoning designation, okay? Um, so here in the city of Hamilton, they have a nice interactive map. We type in the address, boom, it pulls up. In this case, it's a C uh, designation. Um, so then we, we go to the city website. We go under their bylaw. In this case, it's the former city of Hamilton bylaw. And we, we pull up and find out what's permitted under the, the C designation. Um, okay, so this goes for any designation. And basically you're looking for the permitted uses, okay? This is key, the permitted uses. What is permitted? What is What can you do as of right, okay? Um, and we're looking for this type of language, sec secondary dwelling units, secondary dwelling unit, detached, accessory dwellings, duplex dwelling, detached accessory dwelling, additional dwellings, converted dwellings, ac accessory apartments. Every city has their different terminology for what, how they define these, these units, okay? So you have to look for these types of uh, terminology, okay? When we get into the commercial buildings, um, you know, we're looking for terms like multiple dwelling or dwelling units, uh, plural. Um, dwelling units in conjunction with a commercial use or something. We're looking for something that tells us we can do more than, more than three units. Um, for those larger projects. So really understanding your permitted uses is, is key, okay? And then obviously in the bylaw, um, it's gonna tell you all of the regulations, okay? So a secondary dwelling unit detached, in this case, it's gonna tell you your setbacks, your maximum height, um, you know, unit size, uh, number of bedrooms, parking requirements, et cetera. We're gonna start seeing, in light of the new announcement, we're gonna start seeing these bylaws get amended over time, okay? You gotta give the municipalities time to go and amend their zoning bylaws. And we're gonna start seeing some of these regulations hopefully be removed, okay? Um, I know for instance, the city of Hamilton just recently removed their parking requirements, okay? This was even before the provincial announcement. So we're gonna see the rest of the municipalities fall in line when it comes to parking. But parking has always been, well, it still is until they change the, uh, the bloody uh, bylaw, but parking, parking is still an issue, okay? And most, in most cities, um, in most zones. like So I'm being very general here, okay? Because um, it is very specific, but you do need you know, one space per unit in most cases. And this is oftentimes our, our biggest challenge because those parking spaces have to be within the legal lot line. Um, and sometimes there's landscaping requirements that have to be maintained. Um, you know, parking can be arranged in lots of different uh, arrangements, but it has to follow the parking bylaw. Okay, um, but you know, thankfully, it sounds like we're going to be having to worry less about parking um, with with um, the, the new announcement. So to go talk about parking as as an issue. So our um, so I I I applied for a garage conversion. Okay, an existing garage conversion. It did make the media. There's lots of uh, so we had a lot of nimbyism about this project. Um, it made the newspaper, you know, we had a lovely uh, local ward councillor there in the yellow jacket who, um, you know, pretty much was an anti-housing uh, advocate. Um, he was not in favor of housing of any sort. Um, he voted against the uh, secondary dwelling unit bylaws. He's voted against lots of intensification bylaws. Um, so he wasn't really our friend. Um, so uh, so this, this, was the, this was the property here. Uh, you know, typical bungalow, okay? We did get permits uh, as of right to add a basement apartment, um, but in order to get the garage unit in, we needed one variance 
for a reduction in one parking space, okay, to go from three parking spaces, which is one per unit, we could only fit two as per the parking bylaw. Um, you know, so we, we, you know, we apply for the minor uh, the variance application. Here's a picture of the, the existing garage, you know, good solid garage, underutilized, just full of, full of junk, right? Like so many garages. Um, but uh, it could, you know, well, it will be a nice, beautiful living space for somebody. So, you know, we did our site plan application. We showed that we can fit two parking spaces. Uh, you know, we showed the existing garage, et cetera. So, you know, it goes through circulation, planning staff recommend approval, uh, you know, because planning staff are smart, okay? Um, but uh, this is what we get from our uh, lovely neighbors, okay? We get petitions, we get signed petitions. Uh, I think there is a, like, over 150 signatures. I couldn't even fit them all on my screen, um, but fighting against our application. Um, so our variance was denied nine to zero, okay? And this is, you know, this is not uncommon when it comes to adding density and intensification, right? We get a lot of pushback from neighbors and this is something that we as investors have to, you know, uh, develop thick skin sometimes in order to kind of fight against the nonsense that is out there. But, you know, uh, Committee of Adjustment denied it based off of the, uh, the pressure from the community and the local ward councilor. But guess what happens? 83 days later, uh, the city themselves amend their bylaw to remove the parking requirement. Um, and, and so basically we could then in turn um, reapply uh, to get the, uh, the unit approved. But what happened here is they caused, cause they had a, a you know, a, a not what I, what I call a not like a, like a not common sense bylaw, like a really outdated bylaw. Uh, so basically because they didn't have a common sense bylaw in place already, um, they caused so much neighborhood strife um, and fighting amongst the neighbors um, for, for nothing is ridiculous. Um, long story short, uh, this article gets posted yesterday uh, so here's me and my client standing in front of the garage with both of our building permits, and we're now proceeding with the uh, with the construction of this unit. Um, so that's that's what's going to be happening as of right, right? As they start cleaning up these bylaws, there's going to be less fighting, hopefully, with neighbors because we can do things as of right. NIMBYism is is very powerful. Okay, so um, moving on. Okay, so how do we get this done with all of during these tough times, okay? So um, like one of the things is, is we have to be patient, okay? Um, you know, everybody's messaging me right now about this announcement. I'm like, guys, like, like they ain't changing the, the bylaws tomorrow, okay? Like it'd be lucky if we see changes in six months from now, okay? Because it has to go through committees and uh, counselors and they have to draft things and they might have public consultations and all this kind of bullshit. So um, you got to be patient, okay? Um, you know, uh, you know, we still have supply chain issues. Like as much as you know, they can ease the regulation. You know, they haven't done much to fix the supply chain issues or increase the amount of skilled labor that's coming in this country. Um, so we still have major issues with actually getting this stuff done, uh, actually building these units. Um, you know, there's there's many projects that are just taking longer to uh, get completed, okay? Back orders, appliances, windows, up, hydro upgrades, you name it, okay? A lot of our buildings departments are understaffed, okay? So you also have to, you know, give them some grace to a certain extent. Uh, you know, we always like to berate our building planners and uh, building inspectors and stuff, but they are under a lot of pressure. They're, they're understaffed. Um, so you have to be planning well ahead, okay? Um, and you have to uh, look for those projects that you can do more as of right, so that you can avoid the committee of adjustment. Um, you, know, you know, you have to be engaging your designer very early on in the process um, as you're doing your due diligence on the project to see um, if you can do everything as of right, or if it's gonna trigger a variance or trigger rezoning or an official plan amendment. Um, Last thing you want to do is, is buy a building and realize you can't put as many units in there as you thought, right? And you get into a lengthy kind of rezoning process. Um, you know, you just got to planning, planning, planning well ahead is, is key during this time. 
Um, and, you know, again, um, we got to keep developing and maintaining our relationships out there. Um, you know, things are going to, um, you know, as they continue to ease the regulation uh, and, and more opportunities come up, uh, you know, the demand, the, the demand has not gone away, okay? Um, the fundamental demand is still there. And so once uh, interest rates uh, go back to normal, um, we're going to see a huge influx of people buying again. Um, so now is a good time when things are slower out there uh, in the real estate world is to work on your power team, okay? Um, you know, talk with the agents, the lawyers or accountants or designers, build, build your power team, develop uh, relationships with your trades. Um, and, you know, I've learned this the hard way, uh, don't burn bridges, you know, um, as, as frustrating as it can be sometimes when we do intensification projects, um, you know, you don't want, you got to be friendly, okay? Uh, you, you can't be rude to the people at the building department or the planning department. You know, a lot of these people are just frontline staff. Um, and, you know, so oftentimes, you know, we know more than they do about, about the requirements. And so sometimes we have to educate them. You know, don't get me wrong. A lot of times I'm getting educated on uh, bylaws and building code from them. But same thing, we also educate them. It's like everybody's human beings, right? Every, everybody, you know, everybody's learning. Everybody, you know, makes mistakes. So you know, we just have to be nice to people, okay? Um, okay, so some just some lessons learned uh, getting into this stuff, especially when you're looking at building new um, or adding a coach house or an addition, okay, is to get a legal lot survey, okay? I don't know. It's been so many times people have jumped into a, a coach house project um, and they're, they're basing all of their plans off of like on-site measurements of their property, measuring the fence lines or the sidewalk edges or something. Um, and they're not, they're not creating their, their site plans based off of legal lot surveys. Okay. And then they find out, you know, much later on in the process, when they go and make a submission to the city, that the city record is saying something different. And the plan examiner points it out to you and saying, wow. Our, our records say you don't have this dimension, and now all of a sudden you've triggered a, a minor variance or something. So really, really important, guys, when you're doing coach houses, any sort of new construction on your property, whether it's an addition, second floor addition, doesn't matter, get a legal lot survey. And, you know, it can take, you know, eight weeks sometimes or longer to get a survey. So um, it, it's been, for me, I've learned the hard way. It's, it's caused a lot of delays on projects sometimes. Um, soundproofing. So, you know, for anybody who knows me, um, I'm, I'm a big uh, advocate on soundproofing our units, right? We're, we're in the industry of, of creating housing, um, creating nice spaces for people to live. Uh, sound, soundproofing is huge, okay? Um, and there's, you know, I've done some testing on um, soundproofing. I got some videos that are out there on it. Um, the bare minimum building code for soundproofing is crap, okay? That's why if we just do bare minimum code, we still get noise complaints. We still have people moving out. Um, you know, so you have to go over and above code when it comes to soundproofing. And there's lots of product, products out there. Like the main one that we're using is Sonopan. Um, it's a good cost-effective way of getting additional soundproofing in your, your, your project. Um, and this will make or break uh, a, a, a tendency, okay? I've seen it very often. I've been involved in a lot of conflicts with um, you know, investors and their tenants about noise um, and because of lack of soundproofing products that were installed. Um, I've seen tenants move in and move out uh, and causing a lot of infighting between tenants because of noise. So it's either you pay for it now or you pay for it later. At some point in time, you're gonna pay for lack of soundproofing. Um, it's not necessarily fair to just put it on your property manager and say, well, I'm not managing the property myself. My property manager is dealing with the complaints. Well, that's not being a very good investor if you're just passing off your complaints or your issues to somebody else to deal with. Um, you're not being a very good housing provider. So um, guys, focus on soundproofing. Uh, we're out here to make good, good, safe, enjoyable places to live. Um, ceiling heights, okay? Learn this the hard way. Um, especially when we're finishing our basements, um, okay? There's been lots of times when um, the basement height is too low and we find out too late in the game 
and the inspectors aren't allowing, they won't pass the inspection. Um, and then we have to go work backwards and dig out the basement and do benching uh, or underpinning. Um, so it can get uh, very costly. So you really have to know your heights, and double check, triple check, especially up front before you purchase a property. Uh, very, very crucial. Um, okay, so I'm just about to wrap up um, and then we can jump into questions. Um, but, you know, when it comes to this type of work, guys, I, you have to get professional drawings done, okay? Especially when you're doing coach houses um, and additions, you know, site plans are, are key, showing parking, landscaping, setbacks, um, you name it. Uh, and these site plans should be drafted ideally um, off of a legal survey, okay? Just looking at city aerial maps or measuring defense lines is not, is not satisfactory. Okay, um, you can download my checklist, uh, legalsecondsuites.com slash checklist. Uh, you can find me again on Facebook, Instagram. Please book a consultation um, before you, you know, dive into a project that you're uncertain about. Um, I'd rather spend, you know, 30 minutes on the phone with you um, to catch any issues before you start um, putting in firm offers on, on properties, okay? Um, okay, so Luke, um, okay, so I'll pass it back to you. Um, we can jump into questions. There's, there's going to be a bunch of questions and, and, and stuff like that. But look, guys, opportunity is everywhere. It's really the name of the game right now is the bigger, the better. Okay. The bigger, the building, the better, the bigger, the house, the better, the bigger, the land parcel, the better. Okay. Cause, uh, that means we can add more units. And right now it's all about adding units. Okay. We can no longer just do a single family home and a basement apartment. Like, that, that ship has sailed a long time ago. We have to be doing tries or fours, um, you know, six, seven, eight, ten, whatever. Uh, we got to be adding units. Um, you know, I believe strongly that the future is in housing creation, okay? Not just housing renovation, housing creation, creating house units that have never, ever existed before. Um, so, all right, Luke. Awesome. Thank you very much, Ken. That was awesome. Um, what we're doing is, again, if you look at the bottom of your screen, guys, there's a Q&A section. So any questions you have, instead of putting in the chat, put it into the Q&A section. Um, after my presentation, Ken and I are both going to be answering questions from the Q&A uh, that, you, that you drop in there. Um, so I'm going to get started. Let me see if I can figure out how to share my screen. So, um, Do you want me to stop sharing my screen? Uh, that would make sense. Stop share. Okay, there we go. Share screen. Okay. One second here, guys. Okay, so here's a question. Or do you want to start, Luke, or what? All right. Can you see, you see uh, the coach has a slide? Yeah. Do you see? Oh, yeah. no, you don't. Do you see it? Do you see the coach has a slide now? Yeah, I see it. Perfect. Okay. Um, oh, all right. So um, a little bit about me. Um, my name's Luke. I, uh, I run the, the largest wholesaling company in Canada for, for real estate. So we buy houses across uh, Ontario, Quebec, uh, well, mainly Montreal and, and Quebec, um, and, uh, and British Columbia, uh, mostly around Vancouver. And what we typically do is we buy them to, uh, to resell on the MLS or to sell to other investors. That's what we call wholesaling. Um, we've bought about 650 houses to date. We buy about 250 houses a year right now. Um, and then my wife and I as well, we have about 100 rental units in our rental portfolio. Um, I'm also a father to a two-year-old little girl. And uh, my wife, Jess, and I uh, uh, run the, the rental properties together. Um, so some of the things I wanted to touch on in particular, I thought I'd just give a, um, a few, a little bit of a sample about what I'm doing on a couple coach houses in Ottawa, in part to show how it's different in every city and you have to follow uh, the rules that they have. Um, and also how, you know, it can help you think differently because, um, because of the business we're in, we typically uh, don't just target the homes you would typically think of for an SDU or a coach house, 
And we try to see, well, what's the best opportunity with this home? And sometimes um, it can be adding different units. Personally, in most areas I invest, I want tenants to be able to park a car, um, whether or not parking is required. Um, and I typically prefer them not to have tandem parking where they have to move a car to get them out. That's a personal preference. It's also um, easier to manage, I find. Um, so there, even though some cities may allow you to have parking spots in tandem, I prefer not to deal with that. So if there isn't street parking, I typically limit myself to however wide I can get a driveway is going to be. If I can get two car wide, um, I'm going to typically limit myself to three units, or if I can get three wide or find a different way to, to manage it so that you can park three cars without and get them out without moving another car, then I'll, I'll be willing to go up to three units. So the first example I'm going to give you is under construction. So I don't have the finished pictures, but I think it's an interesting project. To start, here's some of the, the background on it. Um, and do you see my next slide, Ken? Or do you just see the, the current slide? Uh, just the current one. OK, perfect. Um, <laughs> so this is just, I pulled this right off the impact so you guys can see what's there. It's, it's a typical two-story detached home. I'd call it a starter home because it's under 1,100 square feet. But two-story homes, you know, there's no separate entrance to the basement. And um, digging a walk, it's expensive. Um, and even if you do, you're going to have a very small basement apartment, probably something like 506 square feet. Um, well, actually, you can see the basement is 506 square feet. So you'd have quite a small apartment. So typically, people would look at this type of house and think, this doesn't really work too well for an SDU. Why would I buy this? Um, this is the house. This is just off Google Street View. Um, you can see that parking's a little bit tight, but we can actually have a little bit of room to widen it to the side. Um, but it's just a typical starter home. You wouldn't necessarily think of this as two units. But when you try to understand the zoning bylaws and the, the rules of the city, this one happens to be in Barhaven in Ottawa. Um, and you have certain things you're allowed to do. So here you can see it's actually not a very big backyard. Um, it's a 35 feet by 100 foot lot, and you can see both on the, the plans, um, on the survey plans, and on, on the geo warehouse drawing, you can see the size. It, you would think you can't really build a coach house here. However, um, we were looking at the rules, what we're allowed to do, and Ottawa has very specific rules. And I mention this in part because it causes problems for different reasons, and every city has these, uh, I don't want to use the stupid word, but I'll call them a little bit stupid. A little quirks. Ottawa, for example, has a rule where um, a coach house has to be either less than one meter to the lot line or more than four meters. So you can't, your coach house can't fall between one and four meters of a lot line, which is strange. And then, of course, if it's less than four meters, you can't have a window on that side um, in the, that bylaw. So it actually ends up um, cost, creating additional costs, of course. Um, in part because if you're less than a meter from a lot line in a small yard, you're going to have additional frost proofing costs. Um, you know, it's going to be very hard to go vertical with less than one meter there. So um, for a little bit of context, what it looks like, this is a uh, not too great picture of the backyard. Uh, there were cedar hedges all hung everywhere. <clears throat> and we tried to keep them as much as we could. You can see this is not a big backyard. And this is uh, the cement slab that we poured. Um, and also note that different cities have different rules. Ottawa, for example, um, you're supposed to tie the, um, the water and sewer to the house. Um, and of course, we did a separate meter. So that's the, the slab board. That is the framed in uh, and outside insulation on it. Uh, it's about, it's around 500 square feet. Um, so, and that is the, again, this is not finished on the inside yet, but that gives you an idea. We recently closed on the outside. So I'll go back to the beginning. That's what we were working with. And that's what we finished with. Um, something I will say about what Ken said and, and is important here is um, we've got some projects where we're dealing with uh, community adjustment. Um, one of them is a consent application where no minor variances are even allowed. And yet we're still getting a lot of community opposition, neighbors who don't want more buildings in their area, all of that. And uh, we've been kind of pushed back multiple times. And it's a constant battle because as soon as NIMBYs get involved, the city councilors want to make them happy or, or the Committee of Adjustment members want to make them happy. And it, it is a frustrating battle. In this case, as Ken said, we followed the rules where we were allowed to build this as of right. I know this looks very big for the yard, but we followed the rules to a T. We were able to get a building permit without asking for any variances, which meant the neighbors weren't circulated any information about the building. And we started building and the neighbors went, what? I called the city and they said, you're allowed to build this. How can you build something 
so close that I locked. That's the rules. That's what's allowed. And that's why we're able to build more structures. And from that the announcement today, it sounds like that's what they're trying to do more of, um, trying to remove nimbyism and opposition. Because of course, neighbor, many people will say, yes, we need more housing, but I don't want this near my, near my house. Go build somewhere else. And then when you go somewhere else, they say, well, I don't want that near my house either. So go build somewhere else. And then you don't end up building anywhere. So um, this was allowed as of right, and the neighbors were shocked, and yet we're allowed to do it, and we're doing it. Um, so this is what it looks like along the side, or what it looked like as it was being built, uh, a little closer to now. Um, the inside framing, this is it spray foamed, because we are, um, we're actually using electricity to heat. Uh, it's actually going to be a, a heat pump for uh, the majority of the space, because this is a bachelor. I'll call it a junior one bedroom when I'm listing it for rent, um, but there's not going to be a doorway between um, the living room and the bedroom. Um, so it is one space. Uh, it'll have airflow. So one heat source plus electric base where it says backup, which likely won't be needed within well insulated shelf. And then there it is uh, drywalled in. It's a little further than this now, but that, that gives you a good idea um, where we're looking at now. The plumbing that, that's coming out of the ground, that's going to be where your sink is, dishwasher beside it. And the back behind it's going to have you know sinks, uh, fridge, soap, et cetera. There's a small utility room, um, and yeah, that's uh, that's your little that's the coach house. So one of the things I wanted to mention on this specific property was the slab. So this is something again when you deal with someone like Ken who knows the rules in a specific city, um, it's going to be a little bit easier for you. Ottawa, a little more difficult for us, <laughs> especially as we're trying to figure things out. This slab, oh. Cost us $31,000. Yeah. Um, Holy smokes. Yes, way too much. Part of the problem was um, pouring in the winter uh, was part of it, uh, or trying to, because yeah, we had to heat the ground. Um, they didn't like the compression tests. We had multiple engineers visits. Uh, and then, um, and I didn't include a photo of it, but we also had to do um, vertical uh, frost protection to ensure it wouldn't freeze. So you have to dig down beside the slab and do a vertical insulation. Uh, and in Ottawa, um, the frost line's five feet, not four like uh, much of Southern Ontario. So you have to go even further uh, because you have to do it vertically because you can't do it outwards um, because you have to be less than one meter from the lot line um, because the city requires that for some reason. So um, yeah, I really like this project. It's gonna be a great little house. I wanted to show you what we're doing on another property, even though I don't have as full uh, pictures, but this one is actually honestly a little bit better of a property for this purpose. You can see it's a wider lot. It's almost 60 feet wide by hundred. Um, it's a bungalow on the property now at the front and behind it, there's a much lar larger yard. And on top of that, there is a side street. So it's a corner lot. So what we're going to do is um, the coach house, they're gonna park in the front they're going to walk along the sidewalk and they're going to have a gate in the back fence and they're going to have their own yard and their own little house right in the back. It's going to feel very separate. It's going to feel like its own house. And other than sharing parking, they're going to feel like two separate houses. Um, you can see on the drawing the proposed coach house here. Um, it's going to be somewhere around 450 square feet. It's going to be, uh, again, a junior one bedroom. Um, so we're building these quite small um, in part to keep construction costs down. One of the things I like about the coach houses is um, compared to basement apartments, which can, which are excellent as well for different reasons, but you tend to have more water issues in basements. Um, and you tend to have more noise issues in basements. So Ken, as Ken mentioned, um, my theory behind this as we're building these is that it'll actually be easier to manage two separate houses with small yards than one house that's shared as two units. So again, Theoretically, some of these either now or in the future, some of our houses would allow three lots, three units, but we're choosing to do two um, because it's what made sense for us. And we wanted to fit it in with the parking for these kind of suburban homes that don't aren't the best for transportation otherwise. Um, in the future, either in some of, the, some of the homes now would be allowed or in the future, these ones would be allowed. <coughs> but we may not choose to add the third unit, um, depending on what it is, as long as the numbers work. Um, but depending on the parking rules, we could choose to do so as well. So I wanted to give a little bit of, of an idea of this and show you a little bit what we're doing on this house. You can see in the backyard, um, it, it's a little bit hard to tell, but what we've actually built here is um, we're building this on what's called helical piles. 
So they're basically these giant metal screws that are screwed into the ground um, and they're, they're set to a certain um, pressure level. So they need to hit a certain level so they can carry a certain amount of load. Um, the companies that do it, uh, the helical piles, they, um, they, they can get the engineering required. So they, they know what, what load is gonna be carried on that and they can show that it's gonna support it. And so the cost to build this, and I'm saying helical pile alone, I believe was around $4,000 for the helical piles. It's not a lot. You still have to build a floor package. You still have to insulate separately. And so there's still gonna be a cost to that, but we're testing this out as a different way of building. Now, normally I would have actually liked to build this much taller, build in a proper crawl space and enclose it. However, uh, Ottawa has very strict rules. And this is why I'm saying, whether you're in Hamilton, Ottawa, or in Vancouver, whatever you're trying to figure out, every municipality is gonna have little differences. So there's the theory here, and then there's understanding um, your specific municipality's rules. Ottawa has very strict height limits. Uh, I believe it's 3.1 meters total building height from the average grade. Um, if it's a flat roof and something like 3.7 meters, if it's a pitched roof uh, to the, the to the middle point of the peak, right? So you have you're very limited on um, on height, which means I would like to have a better crawl space, allow you properly insulate it and and run plumbing and everything through it. So we have we here we're trying to build it a little bit tighter. That's why we did slab on grade for the last one. I've seen in Ottawa people do basements, but the basements end up very deep underground because of the height requirements, you can't have that sticking too far above ground. So you end up with a basement that's that's very far underground <coughs> and has very little windows. So we thought cost-wise, it'd be worth trying something like this. So that's what we're doing. Now, one of the things I would also say is um, someone might ask, well, you've got this bungalow. If you, you see on the bungalow or if you saw the front of it, you'd see there's a door right off the side that goes up and goes down. So you can access the basement separately. But in this case, the bungalow's basement was actually in very good shape already had two bedrooms down there, already had a full bathroom. Um, and to meet, to do them properly for an SDU, all of that would have to be torn out. We wouldn't have been able to save everything. So we would have been starting from scratch where we have already a very good basement, which adds value to the main home. Um, and so for us, we were able to rent the main home. We're able to rent the main home for more money than we get for just the upstairs unit and then separately rent the coach house for maybe a little bit less than we get for the larger basement unit, but combined we're getting about the same amount in rent um, as doing a basement uh, and, and a full duplex conversion. And the coach house is gonna cost us less to build than um, putting in a basement apartment. So um, this, is, this can be adding this to existing duplexes. This can be um, taking an existing, a single family home, making three units, or this can just be a different tool in your toolbox when you look at a different home. Um, you could, for example, take a semi-detached house and go, hey, am I allowed to put a coach house there? I can buy that inexpensively, but now I can put a coach house in the backyard of that. So I'm paying hundred grand less for the semi. And then I'm able to put a coach house in the backyard because that lot happens to work. Some lots are just happen to be wider than the ones in the neighborhood or, or whatever it is. So um, depending on the city, remember the, the rules, I believe you're allowed to build uh, technically as small as, Ken will know this better, but something around 170 square feet. Is it 170 plus bathroom, Ken? Do you know? Like the minimum size? The minimum by Ontario building code, not for, not city. So it's, uh, I believe it's 188 square feet. Okay, plus yeah. 10 square feet or so for the bath. So you could technically build a 200 square foot unit um, in theory, but um, you may not want to build that small, but just so you, so you understand that it, it is a possibility um, to build quite small. Um, another thing that I'm excited about is these rules is um, we own some cottage rentals as well. And so as the province is announcing, um, announcing that you're going to be allowed across the province to build up to three units on, on, on a residential lot, depending on how each municipality defines it, we might look at some of our rural properties that have a lot of excess land and go, wow, we could build a really cool cabin elsewhere on the lot separately within, because it is on one lot instead of applying for a severance. And now we could have two, um, two Airbnb or uh, short-term rental cottages on operating on one lot and, and have uh, less cost of that. So there's so many exciting opportunities with this. Um, if you want to follow along with uh, the specific coach houses that we're building, I've, I've been posting them here on our, on our um, Just Luke Invest uh, Instagram page where my wife and I share some of the projects in the multifamily. And then these are the coach houses here in the middle that I circled in red. Um, if you want to follow along as we build them and finish them. 
Um, and that's where to follow us. And I believe uh, it, most people here will be on our buyers list. So if you're looking for off-market properties uh, and you're not on our buyers list or you want to send it to someone else, you can go to offmarketbliss.ca. Uh, and that is the end of my presentation. Uh, and how do I stop sharing? There we go. Okay, so um, now is a good time to, um, <clears throat> to go into the Q&A. Ken, are you ready? It would help if you unmuted yourself. Perfect. Yeah, I started <laughs> to answer some of the questions, okay, in the question and answer, uh, just because um, I thought- Because you don't know how to stop working. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I know, let's, uh, we can talk about some of them with the, uh, with the group. Um, Absolutely, that'd be great. So uh, we'll um, appreciate on uh, it. We can both expand on. Uh, one of the questions was the cost, right? The cost yeah. of a of a ADU. So um, so you know what? I, I actually today I had a meeting with a modular home builder, and this was a topic that we talked about is the is the cost, right? Um, so right now, uh, the problem that I see is that you can build these things a number of different ways, right? There's lots of different ways that you can go about building a coach house, right? Or a laneway home. Um, you know, are you doing it in a more traditional manner? Is it tr traditional stick frame? Is it on a poured concrete foundation? Is it on a engineered uh, concrete grade slab? Is it helical piers, right? Um, is it a two-story structure? Is it a one-story structure? You know, what's your total gross floor area? Are there, are there basements? Sometimes people are adding basements into these units now too. So um, the cost per square foot um, is all over the map. Like I know people that are doing it downtown Toronto have a very different price per square foot than people out in Haldeman County, okay? Or Norfolk County or in some rural county somewhere. Um, so um, it's I big picture, like I've seen, you know, people throw out numbers around $200 a square foot. I've seen people tell me, Ken, it's $500 a square foot, you know, but it's like anything, it's scope of work. Um, so it's, it's really hard to put a cost on. It's so specific to your, to your project. Okay. Um, so that's really the long and short <laughs> answer. Yeah. It depends. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, and I would say, so people know, I, Ottawa, I have found personally, because I've, I've done duplexes. <laughs> For some context, my first duplex conversion was in 2013 in Aurelia. Um, back when duplexes were relatively new and Aurelia wasn't really allowing them easy. And I actually had to, uh, I, I needed a minor variance because my lot was one meter not wide enough. Um, and I went to the committee of adjustment and they denied me uh, because the neighbors came and they were older and they didn't want, you know, potentially the two units being rented to students and all of this. So uh, I appealed it to what was back then the Ontario Municipal Board um, and was able to, uh, I won't say I knew what I was doing, I was guessing around and I managed to figure it out. I managed to get it done, but uh, managed to appeal it. Uh, what was wonderful was, like Ken said, the city planners are smart. They're, um, they know they know what's, what's required. So at the Ontario Municipal Board, I had to summons the city planner, the senior city planner who wrote a favorable report for me to get a minor variance. And so Aurelia, had to basically try to oppose its own senior planner reading his report saying this should be approved. Um, so they really had no way to defend it. Um, anyway, so we got that approved. But for the reason I was saying that was this duplex conversion cost me $55,000, um, including paving a double wide driveway, a full basement, three bedroom, one and a half bathroom, uh, legal duplex, legal second unit, um, and adding laundry upstairs. I was able to do that for $55,000 in 2013. I have spent as much as $275,000 doing a large, it included a lot of the upstairs work, included a flat roof, um, but this was a, a four bedroom, well, four bedrooms up, one and a half bedroom up, bathroom up, four bedrooms down, two bathrooms down with a with a separate walkout and everything. But I spent as much as $275,000 on a basement apartment and that was uh, finished in the last 12 months. Um, the coach houses that I'm building, I think I'm going to be able to build them out for about $150,000 when I'm done. Um, but again, I'm building them very small and I'm trying to find more inexpensive ways to build them because I think it is so important. I want them to be durable, but I also want to be able to build enough of them less expensive because it is so important to add to the housing stock. Um, 
So yeah, that, those are just my numbers. That doesn't mean you're gonna be able to replicate those and you might be able to build them for cheaper or it might cost you a lot more. Um, I found when you go to a lot of these, um, the general contractors who deal with just homeowners, you're gonna see very high prices. Um, and Ken, I haven't figured it out with a modular builder to make something um, that it all seems to make so, sense. Yeah, like my, I had a you know, great conversation today with the modular guy, um, but basically he flat out told me, he's like, it's not gonna be cheaper than stick framing you know, um, and, and I was under the assumption that mods are, it's going to be more efficient way of building, therefore less expensive. But the problem is it's not modular building can be equally as expensive as, um, you know, traditional frame. The benefit of modular building is that a lot of the work can be done offsite. Um, so that really can reduce your onsite construction. Um, but uh, anyways, I left the meeting, um, is, is great, but uh, I'm, I'm not 100% sold uh, modular. I got to see it to believe it. Um, okay, moving on, we got other questions here, Luke. Um, okay, so there's a bunch of questions about like zoning specific questions. Oh, sorry, you know what, Ken, just because we, we have a few questions here uh, that, that touch on this. Um, okay. I don't know if you know that because I haven't done one of these. Have you found how do you find they compare the cost to build a detached SDU versus converting a garage to an SDU? How have you found the costs typically? Um, I'm not saying necessarily an amount, but are you finding it more expensive to convert a garage or keeping the structure actually is cheaper? Um, so like converting an existing garage or building a, like a new one from scratch? Build, converting an existing garage to a, to a detached SDU or yeah, to a coach house or garden suite versus building a new garden suite from scratch? Which one have you found to be? Oh yeah, like, uh, well, look, it really depends on the state of the existing garage, okay? Um, you know, some people, they show me their garage. And I'm like, guys, this thing's a teardown. Like this thing is, the concrete slot it's sitting on is all cracked and heaved and, you know, it's not worth putting the money into it. Um, so we, we opt to tear it down. Um, but if you have a solid building, solid garage, nice, I don't know, it could be cinder block, could be, a, could be brick cladded or just a really good structurally framed garage. Yes, absolutely. It is cheaper to work, <coughs> right? If it's on a good foundation. Um, no, absolutely, 100%. But, uh, but still don't underestimate the cost. Uh, you're still creating a dwelling unit, right? So it's just like doing a basement apartment. You, know, you can spend 150000 doing a basement apartment, just the basement, not, not including the main floor stuff. So we're seeing numbers like that as well for for existing garage conversions, you know, 140, 150,000 for a typical like five, 600 square foot existing garage. Um, you know, that's just a couple of examples that I can think of recently. Um, but it depends on the size of the garage and, you know, what type of utilities are you running there? But guys, it's not just the construction itself. When you're doing these coach houses, you got to budget in money for landscaping, regrading and sodding the lot, maybe pouring concrete walkways, maybe building new fences, maybe planting a tree or two, you know, um, there's so much landscaping work that, you know, landscaping is not cheap either, right? So you could easily spend 50,000 on top of your build price just on repairing the lot, right? Um, so it's something that people often, they don't think about when they're yeah. kind of budgeting their build price, it's a landscaping price. Absolutely, and can, um, do you know, when you see, let's say in, in the Hamilton area, what are you seeing uh, these coach houses rent for, or the garden suites? Um, yeah, so, um, so my one client that we just finished an existing garage conversion. Uh, again, it's a bachelor unit, okay, or a junior one bed or whatever you want to call it. Um, a little bachelor unit, five hundred square feet. Um, and so it's going on the market, I think, for $1,800 um, uh, plus utilities, plus hydro um, and water. Yeah. So, okay. Um, but that's just one example, right? Um, you know, sometimes these things can be much, you know, you're on mute, Luke. I think it just helps people to un under to have a little bit of context because uh, yes, for everybody watching, don't assume that you're going to build a coach house and a garden suite and rent it out for 1800. You might get less, you might get more. Um, it just helps to have some numbers. I think my little ones in Ottawa, um, I I'm thinking around the 1650 mark, but I haven't tried to rent them yet. So um, I might try to push that a little bit. We'll see. They would be plus hydro. Water is going to be inclusive for mine. I didn't separately meter them, um, but their heat and electricity is all together. Yeah, like, so. Look, some people's laneway houses, they're renting for the exact same 
as the, the main floor units or the, a single family home, because they are, yeah. they're basically a single family home. Yeah, they have their own yards. They're like, they can be even the size of a condo, but you don't have neighbors, you're not attached, you don't have an elevator and you have a little yard for, for a pet, uh, you know, a dog, cat, whatever. Um, so there's a little bit of a yard there. And, and I think there's a lot of appeal to that. And then you can also stay in some suburban neighborhoods, maybe near friends, family, where you otherwise, um, there's not a lot of smaller rentals as options in a lot of suburban neighborhoods. So that can also be, and again, if it's cost-wise between being in a basement or being in um, a garden suite, some people will choose the garden suite, even if it's smaller. Um, and yeah. some people say, I want more space. I'd rather be in the basement. So um, yeah, you got to evaluate what you can get in rent. One of the other questions here is about like, how do you find contractors for SDU coach houses? Well, it's, it's, you know, it's no different than finding a contractor for anything else. Um, you know, we have a shortage, right? And, you know, to find contractors that, you know, have some semblance of experience with creating a legal second unit, you know, whether it's in the basement or a coach house, like that's even more rare. Okay. Like, you no, know, there's lots of, you know, contractors who can do work on single family homes and, you know, um, but um, but they haven't done work on a legal conversion project before. And, um, and it's not like it's difficult to learn, but, um, you know, uh, there's just a lot of contractors who just haven't had that experience yet, you know. And, and definitely, if you're a contractor listening to this video, um, you know, you got to get yourself educated on conversion work because this is where the future is, you know, it's in housing intensification. So you got to learn what fire separation is, <laughs> you know, um, and soundproofing and, and stuff like that. But, um, but yeah, like if you're going to hire a contractor to build you uh, a coach house or something, I'd be hiring a contractor that is already doing legal, you know, conversion work already. Okay. Uh, on, on a regular basis. Absolutely. I can, one question that there was as well is, um, do you find it's always cost effective to maximize density versus having larger units? Great question. Great question. Um, so when we're looking at a building and trying to figure out like, the unit count um, or the layouts. Um, it's really like, so, you know, when I hear that question, I'm thinking about some of the larger building conversions that we're doing. So some of these 20, you know, 22, 25 unit building conversions, and we're trying to decide, okay, you know, what's, what's the ratio of bachelors versus one beds versus two beds. Um, and it really depends on where the location is. Like what is the tenant profile in that area? What, what rents out easier, you know, like a building conversion downtown uh, versus like a bungalow conversion, you know, or a, a coach house or a century home, like someplace out, like it's, it's going to demand a different type of type of um, uh, unit, right? Um, you know, like the projects that we're doing in the downtown cores, you know, they're bachelors and one beds, you know, uh, they're not really, they're, we're not doing two beds. Uh, or there might be one or two in the mix, but it's, it's rare, you know, um, definitely not doing three bedroom units in those, in those units, but, um, but the bungalow conversions or something, hundred percent, three bedroom, three bedroom units, two bedroom units. We're not doing one bedroom units in those houses. It doesn't make sense, right? That's not, you're targeting the wrong tenant profile if you do that. Um, so yes, you know, and it depends on like a lot of factors, right? Obviously there's just minimum building code requirements. We have to meet for minimum room sizes and natural lighting. And you, know, you might be working around existing windows or existing support columns or what have you. Um, and that kind of like zone is so much that you can do um, with the, uh, the unit layouts to meet minimum code requirements. Um, but at the end of the day, we're trying to, you know, we are trying to maximize how many units we can fit into a building both you know, from the zoning bylaw perspective, but also minimum building code perspective. Just because zoning bylaw may permit four units, doesn't mean that that building that you want to convert can do four units as per code. Sometimes it can only do two or three, right? Um, so it's, it's understanding both the zoning and the building code uh, requirements. Yeah, and I, and I, to add context, I mean, I know since you have that designing background, obviously, uh, and I mean, uh, plans designing, um, you understand laying out a place, a space that works well, um, you know, because obviously I'm sure you've seen this too. There's sometimes some places are set up in a way that they're trying to maximize the number of rumors or the maximum number of units, but they leave very almost unusable spaces 
you know, it's very chopped up or it's, it, it just doesn't flow. There's nowhere to put a couch. There's nowhere to put a TV. And you're like, how do you, yeah, okay, it meets the minimum requirements, but how do you live here? And I know, I know you take that into account and you maybe take it for granted because you've been seeing it so long. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's something I always, you know. Uh, you know, sometimes I have to have these kind of hard conversations with an investor who wants to do a, a three bedroom unit in, in a small basement thinking that they're going to get an extra hundred dollars worth of rent or something, or that it's, the house is going to be praised more because it has that extra bedroom. Well, um, okay. Good luck renting it out. If it's a cramped, like if it's a cramped three bedroom unit versus a more spacious two bedroom unit, like what, like what do you think is going to rent more? Like mm -hmm. you're going to probably get more rent for that spacious two bedroom unit than a cramped three bed. Right. Absolutely. Um, anyways. And, then, uh, and on the same, on the same line, I'm, I'm, uh, probably closing shortly on a property in, in Gatineau in Quebec that uh, I think it's about an 1800 square foot two bedroom. Um, so it's kind of excessive for a two bedroom unit. <laughs> so there, there is a balance. And, and I would just say for, for, um, for me, I always try to look at, you know, highest and best use of, of every property, same as you do. And sometimes that's more units and sometimes it isn't. And one property I bought that's near a college in Ottawa um, it's a semi-detached bungalow. And in the same area, I had taken one and divided into two legal units. In this particular one, it already had um, a full bathroom in the basement as well as a wet bar. So kind of a mini, a kitchenette and two bedrooms, but it wasn't legalized as a second unit. So instead of illegally renting them separately or gutting the whole basement and starting from scratch, I said, well, this is already here. I don't have this large renovation cost it actually is better for me because it's near college to rent to a large group of five friends and I'm getting $3,000 for, for um, a five bedroom semi-detached house that, uh, well, it was a few years ago now, but I paid in the low 300s. So that one made sense as is. But then again, in the same neighborhood, I took another semi-detached um, in bungalow and, you know, that had a, an oil furnace, unfinished basement, and I stripped everything down and, and redid it properly with eight bedrooms and four bathrooms. So um, across the two units. So it really depends partially on what you're tearing out, right? Because if I say, hey, this is already good and the numbers work the way it is, this actually might work as a larger unit, right? Or maybe I add one bedroom to this basement, but I use it for a larger group of students because it's in a college area versus two units. But then I look at other situations and say, well, this isn't good the way it is. So now I'm gonna be tearing it apart anyways. What's the best that I can put in here? And I know, I know you're very good at that, Ken. So I help some investors convert some, you know, let's say it's a 15 unit building. We're going to bring it up to like 20, 20 units or something. So like some of these buildings, these older buildings, they got like excessively large three bedroom units in the downtown core that they cannot rent. Like nobody wants a three bedroom down there, right? So we're, we're subdividing these units into like a bachelor and a one bed. And you know what? The building's full because there is demand for that type of, type of uh, unit, right? Um, okay. Here's a question. Um, with the risk of a global recession looming, is now a good time to invest to increase units? Uh, great, great question. Great question. Um, the fundamental demand is there. The underlying demand is there. The problem is, um, you know, it's because of because of all this fear that's in the market with interest rates and a looming recession, uh, which we do have to take seriously. Uh, you don't want to put yourself into a bad situation, um, but you know we are seeing price points um, come down in a lot of markets, and we're starting to see a lot of good opportunities present themselves, right? Um, and when the, a lot of people are running from the market, um, it's a good time to be looking for those opportunities, right? But you got to be in a financial position to do it, um, and you know as long as the fundamentals of real estate is still there. Um, you, know, you buy in a good neighborhood, you buy a good property, you do, you do a good value add renovation, you increase the density, uh, you make good, safe, legal, beautiful housing units, um, you're not going to go wrong, okay? But you, you can't over leverage yourself either, right? Um, and so now is you know, more important than ever to really have those um, tough conversations with a mortgage broker or somebody to take a look at your portfolio, see how it's performing. Uh, from a financial perspective, uh, to make sure that you know you have a buffer, right? Um, that that you do have a a, a cushion, okay? Um, but absolutely, guys, the future is in housing creation, okay? Um, you know, the bigger the better. Square footage is sexy, um, 
you know, so absolutely 100%. Yes, we're still buying, you know, um, me and my partners, I think we've bought in eight properties in the last like eight months, uh, eight, 10 months. Um, they're all value add projects. They're all projects where we're adding more than one unit, two, three, four, 15, 20 units to the buildings. Uh, these are projects that are sometimes longer than eight months, six, eight months. Like sometimes these projects are a year, two years long uh, to get completed. So you also got to think about where things are going to be in two years from now uh, and make sure that you're planning today for that future, right? Um, and things do take time. Planning does take time. You know, a minor variance can take time. Uh, building permits can take time. So you do want to be planning planning ahead to where the market is going to be. You want to skate to where the puck is going. Yes, and I would say, um, I, kind of it's just expanding on what Ken said, but I, I completely agree with, um, you're going to see like the typical burr right now. It, I understand why it can be scary to people. You know, you're buying now and you're going to finish, let's say a basement apartment in nine months, six to nine months, and you don't know where prices are going to be values in, in six to nine months. And you don't know where interest rates are going to be in six to nine months. Um, I would say we have a little bit more of an idea. I think we're getting a little bit more um, to, to the end of the, the interest rate hikes. Uh, I'm not saying we're at the end, but um, I think the majority of them have already come. Um, so I think, and, and that also depends on your investing thesis, what you think is going to happen uh, and your, your viewpoint on how many more interest rate hikes are going to be, how much more our price is going to fall in certain areas. So understanding that um, will, will help. Uh, understanding what you believe in there. But I would say, like Ken said, there's a great opportunity for um, to find the right property right now. And for larger projects that are going to take longer, it actually isn't a bad time either. But um, yeah, someone said we're going to have a big interest rate hike tomorrow. Yes, we expect probably, I believe it's 0.75 is expected right now, um, anticipated, unless that's changed recently. Um, not the biggest one we've had. <coughs> but um, what I would say is now is not the time for you to leverage everything you have at very expensive private money on one deal that you need to get a certain number to get out of. If you're in a good financial position, if you have a good cash reserves, it's not a bad time to try to find the right property, create a good quality property you're gonna have long-term. Um, because I mean, there's a reason that Ford is announcing this and I'm saying this for Ontario, but this is across Canada. We're allowing record levels of immigration it has never cost more to build houses. It is insane. The construction cost both labor and material. We don't have the capacity to build homes for everyone that's coming to Canada. So the long term, we need more homes and we need rental housing providers. That is just without a doubt. I hope everyone agrees here. We need more rental housing um, providers. We need more rentals. We need more homes. And um, that isn't going to change long term. So if you have the capital uh, to withstand what may be a little bit more interest rate hikes, a little bit uh, more drop in prices, and you find the right opportunity now to build a quality product that you're going to be happy holding long term, it's still a good time to buy. Um, and, and that's what I'm doing as I've given examples of stuff that we're still buying. Um, I just bought two condos in Hamilton this week, <laughs> or last week. Um, I'm still buying across Ontario, and apparently in Quebec, possibly. So yeah. Um, okay, so um, here's another good question. Uh, what effect on current bylaws does Doug Ford's announcement today have? Easy, nothing. It's just an announcement. So uh, that does not mean that bylaws are changing tomorrow, okay? Um, it takes time for bylaws to change. You know, there's first uh, staff reports, you know, there's public consultations, they have to be presented to the planning committee. They have to be approved, maybe approved by council. Some of these changes could uh, um, maybe uh, require official plan amendment changes, which that all takes time. So, you know, an announcement today will really start seeing those effects, you know, six, eight, 10, mm -hmm. maybe a year from now. Um, as the city, and some cities are very proactive, some are very slow to make their changes. Just because they're mandated by that province doesn't mean they're gonna act quickly all the time. So uh, this is where patience comes in. Agreed. Uh, Ken, uh, another question here. Um, do you think buying in rural areas is a good idea for uh, unit additions and ADUs? So when it comes to rural properties, um, so most municipalities, you know, they put their primary focus on the urban 
areas, okay? They're urban uh, bylaws, okay? So the changes will happen first in the urban bylaws for increased density. Um, and then they start looking at their rural bylaws and start making changes to those, but they, those typically take longer to come about. So, um, so, you know, we are starting to see, you know, as time has come now, since Bill 108 was passed, we're starting to see the rural bylaws starting to be permitted, okay? Uh, for coach houses or additional dwelling units or um, what have you. Um, but uh, there can be a lot of restrictions still on the rural stuff. Um, you know, some, some cities, um, you know, they, they may permit a secondary dwelling unit within the home, but they're not permitting it detached. You know, some, some are permitting it detached in a, in a rural setting. Um, one thing you gotta be aware about is your, um, your septic, okay? When you're in a rural setting, uh, you're not hooked up to city services. Um, every permit application will require a septic report, a septic and well report to make sure that you have adequate um, capacity to accommodate uh, the additional the additional unit. And so sometimes, you know, people get all gung-ho and they start, you know, designing stuff out, but um, they haven't done a septic report. Um, and, you know, to upgrade a septic system can be very, very costly. Um, and sometimes if you're on a small lot or if you're adjacent to a conservation authority or a wetland or something, um, it may not be feasible. Um, so it is something that if you're in the rural setting, you want to add a unit, uh, definitely one of the first steps I would look at is getting your septic system, a septic report to make sure they can handle, handle it. So that's just a little word of advice there. Again, learned, learned the hard way. Well, and something, yeah, uh, something else I'd add on the rural is, um, it can be more expensive or less expensive to build in rural areas because, um, you have typically larger lots, you might have less land restrictions. And so you might have a lot, like for example, compared to the one I was building in Ottawa, where I had to go vertical with the frost protection, et cetera, that's gonna cost me a lot more. If I have a ton of room around it, a ton of room to build separate yards, um, you, you actually might be able to build it cheaper. On the other hand, you may have uh, difficulty getting materials and labor depending on how rural you are. So it can actually, in the right rural area, it could actually actually save you money because it might be very easy just to build something um, and often in rural areas, not always, but building inspectors are a little easier to deal with. Um, they can be a little more lax and a little less stringent on certain things. I don't mean build bad buildings, but some of them go overboard. <laughs> and I find that more so in, in cities. So you may have, uh, you, it may be easier to build. It may also be more expensive to build if you can't get the, the construction labor and materials at a reasonable price. Yeah. Like most, most rural stuff I'm seeing they're 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 quite big, you know, because they have the space, you know, they have the setbacks, they have the lot coverage, you know, um, you know, so they're, they tend to be much bigger structures. So obviously that's going to cost more, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, someone was asking, how do I evaluate a city to determine if it's worth the investment to add units? I don't know if you have any thoughts on this. Yeah, great question. You know, I get asked that often, you know, what about this city or that city or, or this city? Um, you know, from a, you know, every city has different processes for, you know, how they intake applications, how they process them. Every city has different size departments. Uh, the bigger the cities and the more staff they have, uh, but also the more, more red tape and regulations that they have as well. Uh, so big picture, like the bigger the city, the bigger the headache, okay? The smaller the city, the easier it is. Um, so like a lot of these small little townships and rural communities that we do applications in, you know what, there's only like two, three people, uh, you know, behind the desk. Um, and so, uh, you know, they can, they can review applications very quickly because they just don't have a lot coming in. Right. Um, and it's much easier to phone them and they pick up, you know, um, so yeah. The, the bigger the city, you know, the bigger the headache, the smaller the city, the better it is. So if you're going to use that as a requirement, you know, look at these small little rural townships, you know, um, it can be very easy to do projects out there. Yeah. And um, at the same time, it might be a bigger headache in the bigger cities, but you typically can charge more rent in the bigger cities. 
So there's balancing that up. So there's no, there's no right answer. I don't know if there's any city that would say, this is the city you need to build in. It also depends on how much you want to spend. Um, some people would rather spend more money buying and building this out and then getting more rent. Um, so you're basically making a similar return, but uh, on a larger dollar sum so that, you know, it's less fewer tenants for the same percentage return versus someone else might prefer to buy a more inexpensive build to start and build something more inexpensive. Even if the return percentage is going to be the same and the dollar, the dollar total is less, but it's also less dollar total invested. So um, you also have to look at the price point that you want to be investing in. Um, and again, there's still, there's still certain things that can rent. Um, you, you can look at things that may make sense down the road, or um, if you're limited cash-wise on the budget to build, because it's typically hard to borrow the construction cost to build, um, you could look at something where you can buy it now at an inexpensive price with the potential to um, subdivide it later or uh, to, to divide it up into two units, three units at a later point when you have more cash, but you could rent it out as is now in a less expensive market. So there's different ways to do it. Um, and, and I love looking at opportunities on different things. So one example I wanted to give was one we did. It was uh, one of the, the images Ken used to show what you know a second unit was, is um, we bought uh, a, a side split in um, that had an addition, a 350 square foot addition with bathroom built. Um, it had been built 40 years ago or something like that. But um, the whole house had everything it needed, three bedroom house, full bathroom, kitchen, everything it needed, um, separate you know, ductwork for that. And then there was just this addition on the side, long, narrow addition. Um, and we just closed off that wall, fire rated it and made it a legal second unit, 350 square foot bachelor. And that was probably the least expensive um, conversion we've done. And we didn't really pay much of a premium for this house with an addition. So the addition, we were just able to close it off. So there's, there's opportunities like that, where there's a huge range. Um, and sometimes it's, it's the city and sometimes it's just finding the right opportunity within the city. And I would also say, sometimes it's finding the right con person who can manage the project for you. If you need, for example, Ken here, if um, Ken is going to do a project for you in Hamilton or Brantford in an area that Ken is very familiar with and can get you answers on properties very quickly um, and help you manage it easily because he has the contacts and the trades, you might be able to actually build it you know, less expensive because you already have the contacts with the trades and things like that versus going to a new city. You have to figure all of that out. You may end up spending more. So, yeah. um, real quick, I'm going to answer this question live. I was about to type an answer, but uh, Emily had a question about uh, uh, converting existing garages made of cinder block. Um, whether it's good or bad, um, cinder block is awesome. You know, they build, you know, multiple apartment buildings out of cinder block. So there's nothing wrong with the building material, um, but you have to obviously, you got to make sure that you're doing your proper uh, stud walls and insulation and vapor barrier and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but no, nothing is wrong with cinder block. It's, it's a perfectly fine construction material. So. That's my answer. I answered it live. Done. Great. Okay. Uh, Ken, another one. Um, a quick one. Um, when an ADU is added on a corner lot, can the sidewalk on the side of the house be converted into a second driveway? So again, um, this is this would be a zoning specific type of question because it's in regards to a driveway and access uh, to the driveway. Um, so again, some. Uh, zonings do permit, you know, two driveway entryways, especially on corner lots, um, where you are permitted to have another driveway off of, you know, the uh, the uh, side street. Um, but some zoning bylaws prohibit it, so um, it's, it would be a very specific zoning question. Yes, I agree, and I would say in in my experience, um, most of the cities I deal with, you probably can't. In more rural areas, you could probably do it easier. Um, but for example, again, more of my, my rentals are in, in Ottawa and Ottawa for the most part would not allow that. Um, I imagine Hamilton's probably similar where it mostly. Yeah, like I've, you know, we've done it before, you know, and, um, you know, without any issue, but again, it's, it's all, it's very zoning specific. Yes. So you, you have to, yeah, that's why you need to consult with an expert, at least talk to the city. Often the city will, will help you with some of the stuff if you have questions for them. Um, it can be hard to reach them right now. Everyone's everyone's backlogged on labor <laughs> with the pandemic. But here's a great uh, question. Here's a great yeah. question. I purchased a semi-detached in Toronto with an in-law suite. Should I get permits and turn it into a legal suite? 
Um, I plan to rent up and down out. I was wondering with today's announcement, does it mean I can finish my basement without going through legalizing the suite? How long is the wait if I do a legal conversion with the city of Toronto? Okay, so this is a question about whether or not you should legalize your already existing illegal unit, okay? Um, so today's announcement doesn't mean that, you know, you don't have to still, you know, go through a legalization process to get your unit recognized. You still have to do a building permit application and still make sure that you're complying with, you know, whatever the current zoning bylaw is at that time. You know, um, today's announcement hasn't changed a single zoning bylaw. Um, we'll see those changes happen over time, but um, no, you have to still take it through a legalization process. Um, look, there is more advantages to having your unit legal than not legal, okay? Um, very quick, number one, it's legal income, okay? So uh, we all struggle with qualifying, okay? We all need more legal income to our names. Um, so having another source of legal income is huge, okay? Um, that's number one. Uh, number two is just, um, you know, you can sleep good at night because number one, your tenants can't, you know, complain on you about an illegal unit. Uh, a neighbor can't complain on you about an illegal unit. I've seen so many people get um, put into a hard place because of their own tenant, okay? Their own tenant living in that unit, finding out that it's not a legal unit, holding them hostage, calling the city on them. Uh, and they getting busted by the city. Uh, I've seen so many um, cases where, you know, these new smoke detectors, they're super, super sensitive. Uh, so you get these false alarms going off, tenants freak out, they call the fire department, fire department comes down, it's an illegal unit, they notify the building department, boom, you get an order to comply posted on your door. Um, you know, there, it's not worth it. It's so, it's getting so easy to legalize these days. With all of these changes, it's getting easier and easier uh, there's way more benefits to legalizing than not, you know. Um, and at the end of the day, if you want to be a good housing provider, you want to be a good, decent human being, um, do it the right way. Legalize it, you know. Don't be afraid of it. The reason people don't legalize is because they're afraid of the process. They're afraid of the unknown. Um, and yes, there is a cost associated to legalizing, um, but it's a cost of doing business, right? Um, and this is where, you know, a person like myself, this is where we step in and we help you figure it out, right? Like to me, because I've done a lot of conversion work, it's not a scary process to me. This is the process you have to go through. Uh, these are the steps and we help you with that. Um, but the number one reason why people don't want to legalize is because of it's a fear of the unknown because um, they don't know the process. Um, so you got you to gotta hire a professional to help you, but definitely it, it is well worth it to take it through the legalization. Process. Yes, and I would, I would agree that I almost always I would lean towards legalizing where you can, drastically lean towards. There are some situations where it basically is almost unfeasible to legalize, at which point it'd be a question of whether it should even be occupied in the first place. There are some older Toronto homes, very low ceiling height, bad access, no windows. There's some... Uh, not so legal, but yes, consult a professional, whether it's someone like Ken or um, an architectural designer who, who's used to drawing these kinds of things, they can tell you might what whether it's feasible. And if it's just, even if underpinning might be worth it, but there might get to the point where they're like, well, there's, there's, it's not really gonna, it's gonna be $400,000 to make this legal. Okay, then that's maybe a question where it's not worth it. The other so, thing I'd say is what if someone dies in your illegal unit? What if there's a fire and they don't get out? Um, and is your insurance gonna cover it? are, you know, what's the liability on you? Is that worth it as well? I always, so, yeah, worry about that. So here, here's real quick, uh, I don't wanna go too much into this, but you know, you gotta be legal with both zoning bylaw and building code, okay? So, um, you know, if you can't be legal with zoning bylaw because it doesn't allow the amount of units you wanna do there, at least be compliant with building code, especially, you know, fire separation, smoke alarms, means of egress, an egress window. Make sure you're covering the basics, okay? Uh, because look, as we can see, zoning bylaws can change over time with different provincial announcements. And so, you know, if you're gonna be building a fourplex right now, but it only allows for two units, well, build it to the building code for four units so that when they do change that zoning bylaw, 
later on. It's just paperwork. Then you can go back and you just, you know, you file the paperwork, you show the drawings, but you don't have to do a stitch of construction because you've actually constructed it to the code. Yeah, um, and document how you built it. You can take pictures through the process, right? So you can show, yeah, this is double layer, five eighths drywall, et cetera. You can take pictures as you go to make sure you can prove to them that it was done to code and, and up in there. They can accept that as well, right? Um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to touch on something. Some of the people were talking about two things, really. One is about not being able to increase rents, and two, about being able to increase rents for newer units. Um, the previous rules in Ontario used to specify that from the early 1990s, it was built after that, um, it wouldn't be subject to rent control. And it didn't really mention what happened in basements. They clarified when they allowed, um, when they removed rent control for new construction units again in 2018, they clarified specifically um, what happens to the basement apartment. So basically, um, I'm trying to find its own. So in detached houses, semi-detaches, and row houses, this is in the Residential Tenancies Act, um, if the unit became a residential unit after November 15, 2018, and at the time um, the rental unit is located in part of the house, which was unfinished space immediately before the rental unit became a residential unit, um, or at the time that the rental unit was first occupied, the owner or one of the owners lived in another residential unit in the detached house. So either you're doing your own basement, it's not subject to rent control, but where you're living in the house, probably not under corporate ownership, or um, the basement was unfinished or that part of the basement was unfinished. So just to clarify there on the, on the, the lack of rent control, it's only if the basement was unfinished. If it was finished living space um, completely, then you could argue that that is still subject to rent control. But getting on that topic of rent control, what we're talking about here, adding units, these are new units that didn't exist before. You add a coach house that didn't exist before. Under the current provincial rules, that is not subject to rent control. So if I rent out my unit for $1,600 this year and market rent goes up to $1,900 next year, I can increase it if I wanted to, to $1,900. So you have um, these coach houses that I'm building are not going to be subject to rent control. And once per year, I'm not capped at how much I can increase rent within reason for the tenant to move out. But I'm, I'm allowed once per year. I'm not limited to 2.5% like uh, the, um, the rest of existing rental stock is provided. So I don't know if you had mentioned that in your presentation, Ken, I didn't hear it, but that is a huge value add when you build these coach houses that you're not subject to rent control right now. Um, it gives you so much more control um, in a lot of ways. Even if you really have a terrible tenant, um, you can make the price more than market rent and they'll want to leave. Uh, so uh, it, it gives you a lot, a lot more control back. Um, Ken, do you have a question next? Or should I grab one? Um, I'm answering some questions. Okay, I'm typing some answers. Okay. Uh, but yeah, you can grab another question live. <coughs> well, another one was, uh, can you park a mini house or a tiny house in your driveway as an additional unit? What is required to hook up services? Okay, so I was just typing that oh. one. So I'm gonna cancel <laughs> that one and we'll answer it live. So basically, uh, so uh, like a tiny home, that's pretty much what uh, they're getting at. So, um, so look, when it, you know, I was at the tiny home show, uh, the first one um, of its kind uh, that was held in Ancaster this summer. Uh, so tiny homes, like, so a lot of municipalities, like they have, um, you know, they have a garden suite bylaw or they have a, you know, their kind of their secondary dwelling unit detached or their coach house bylaw. So when it comes to a tiny home, um, you know, it could be looked at as a garden suite, which oftentimes could have a temporary uh, time associated with it. Uh, some municipalities would consider it just like a mobile home, which depending on your zoning, um, like this would be more in the rural zones that they would permit like a garden suite or a mobile home. And a tiny home could definitely fit that um, in a more rural setting. Um, in an urban setting, um, they don't typically have the garden suite or mobile home uh, permitted uses. So we look at the tiny home as more of a, you know, secondary dwelling unit detached or a coach house. So basically what's the difference between a tiny home and a coach house? Well, a tiny home is just on wheels, right? So if you truly wanted to use a tiny home for your structure, like you could literally just drive it in, back it in, set it up on, 
some form of a fixed foundation, such as helical piers or sonotubes, um, and it's treated no differently than any other uh, structure that you're going to build. It still has to meet minimum building code requirements, and it's it's looked at in light of the building code as a as an actual secondary dwelling unit. Um, to me, it wouldn't really makes sense to use a tiny home in an urban setting if you're just going to back it in and put it on a fixed foundation because then you're paying extra money for the trailer and the wheels that is only going to be used once to kind of bring it to the location. Um, th that's more suited for like a rural uh, setting, right, where it's truly acting like a mobile home, like with the temporary use. Um, and I would say, but, Ken, I, I've seen a lot of tiny homes not exactly meeting permanent home building code. Right. A lot no, of so in the, tiny values, home, yeah, in the like tiny that. home industry, like it's either they're, they're, they're building them to like an RV standard or a trailer standard um, and not to the Ontario building code. Uh, some builders are building it to the Ontario building code, um, but you have to, you know, look at those specific builders and, and find out what standard they're building to. So, Absolutely. but uh, big picture, you can't just, you know, buy a tiny home and park it in your urban driveway and expect that to meet any sort of zoning bylaw. Yeah. Um, we're just gonna take a couple more questions quickly because we're, we're gonna wrap up at nine, which is in, in five minutes. Um, one question here is a good question is, how hard is it to get insurance for a converted home to three units or for example, a home with an ADU uh, or a detached uh, garden yeah, suite? It's very easy, no different than any other house you're gonna insure. Perfect. <clears throat> um, have you, um, do you have any comments or an opinion on financing properties with an SDU uh, or coach house? Yes, so um, again, we gotta think big picture here. Uh, these types of units have really only, you know, been permitted with, you know, within the last year or so, okay? Um, you know, uh, there's not, you know, they're not everywhere yet. They're, they're, we're, it's really just this construction season that we've started to see them get built, right? Uh, you know, it took about, you know, six months, eight months, 10 months for people to get their planning approvals for them. And this construction season, we're seeing them built. So um, there's just not a lot of data out there truly yet. Um, you know, a lot of lenders, you know, are, are struggling with how to value them. Appraisers are having a tough time trying to value them. Um, you know, um, I think over the next year, as more and more of these get done, we're going to get a better uh, idea what is happening out there with the lenders. I'm not a mortgage broker. I'm not, I don't claim to be one. Um, but from the clients that I work with right now, from what I'm seeing, is they're, they're using their home line of credit um, to, to finance them or a construction loan or a, a private loan. Excellent. Um, somebody asked this question and uh, it's a great time for a little plug for yourself. Um, you're making me very excited, Ken. Do you have any program that will help me access paid service to get your advice when I see an exciting property uh, from Luke to get your thoughts on conversion, finance, et cetera? Yeah, so the way I typically work with uh, my clients is that, look, at the end of the day, I don't want people to make a mistake with something that they, they purchase and they get themselves into a pickle. Um, so, you know, we would typically set up uh, like a 30 minute free consultation just on the phone, just so that I can get an idea of what you're doing. Because oftentimes, you know, through a phone call, we can figure out, you know, a quick, a quick dive into the zoning bylaw or something. We can quickly figure out what we're getting ourselves into. Um, it's not too often that I, I need to do a physical on-site consultation prior to us going on site uh, to take all the site measurements for the actual drawings themselves. Um, most things we can figure out, you know, virtually. Uh, through looking at zoning bylaws, looking at uh, aerial uh, pictures, Google Street View, maybe you know clients will send videos or photos of, of this space. Um, so if I do need to go on site prior to us being engaged for drawings, then I do charge a small fee to cover my time. Um, but I would prefer us to get it sorted out over the phone, which nine out of 10 times we can. Absolutely. And there's that Calendly link. Someone was asking for it again. As we said, when we send out the recording tomorrow, we're going to include that, uh, the link to Ken's website and his Calendly link if you want to get in touch with them. Um, I think, Ken, this is a good time to wrap up. I'm really glad you were, you were able to join us today. Uh, obviously, I, you've got to be uh, the best, if not one of the best in Canada uh, at this topic. So um, 
you know, we really appreciate having such an expert as yourself, me adding a little bit of commentary as uh, compared to you, um, a beginner <laughs> in this space. So uh, yeah, really appreciate Look, uh, I'm learning just like everybody else is learning. Um, the only reason I know what I know today is because after you do a few hundred applications, <laughs> you know, and you get told you're wrong all the time and you get told uh, that you design something wrong, you know, you start to, you start to learn and you start to fix your mistakes. Um, it's only through hard work of doing it often that you become an expert in something, right? Um, so it's always just constantly, constantly, like every day I'm reading a zoning bylaw, right? Um, you know, that's the only way you get good at this stuff is you have to be deep in it. Um, and yeah, like if you, obviously I don't expect everybody to out there to be diving into bylaws and building code, but you know, this is where you hire people who do. So Absolutely. Um, I dream zoning bylaws. It drives me nuts. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm at night dreaming about like a parking setback or something, you know, like. Yeah. Well, and I think so many of the questions people are asking specific questions, if, for example, can a severance be considered uh, for a side-by-side -side duplex to become two separately owned uh, semis? You know, that's typically not, especially because these rules that are being forced down the, the city's throat from the provinces are specific to those to, um, to one lot. That's what they're trying to do. But um, my point is on that is just all of this is it depends. As Ken says, he reads different zoning bylaws. He hasn't just memorized one and considered it good enough. Every city has different rules. So it depends. Um, either speak to an expert or really dig into where you want to do it. Um, and even then, you're still going to want to speak to an expert, um, even if that's an architectural designer who's used to drawing these, so they'll know the rules. So um, do your due diligence, but look for opportunity. There's a ton of opportunities out there that people are missing out on, both price-wise right now and just, um, you know, things with cinder block garages that'd be great to build with excellent structures in certain cities with additions that could be additional dwelling units with great raised bungalows with excellent basements that are underutilized. Um, you know, even just look in a basement when you see that it's completely unfinished. Oh, that means there's going to be no rent control when I finish this unit. That's wonderful. So um, at least for the time being until the next liberal government comes back and changes that, but we'll see. <laughs> so there is a ton of opportunity right now. Um, there's deals from wholesalers like myself, there's deals on the MLS to be had. Find a, don't stop looking for opportunities just because the market's changing, find the right opportunity, get out there and seize the opportunity. And uh, I hope you have, I hope all of us together are able to add more to the housing stock in Ontario and across Canada because there's a lot of immigrants coming to Canada and we need to house them. So let's do it and let's make money while doing it. Thanks everybody. Yeah, thanks everyone. Take care.